Well, good evening, folks. Sorry for about the, the, the brief delay there. Technical problems getting across the channel there. But I have been really looking forward to this show for some time. We're going to leap in straight away and talk about Normandy and how we stood the last, over the last um, 75 years since the war. So I've got a great, incredible panel of guests for you. So coming in, we have one from each country. So Mike from Canada, John Buckley from England, and John McManus from the USA. So I will have to use their surnames to not get confused between my Johns. All three have lectured on D-Day, taught on the Battle of Normandy, guided in Normandy, written about Normandy, been on TV about Normandy. So I couldn't have a better group of people to talk about it. So the question we want to pose over these two shows, because there's this one where we're focusing on the Allies today, and on Sunday we're focusing on the Germans, although there will be quite a lot of overlap, is where are we today in 2021 in our understanding of the Normandy campaign? Do we know more than we've ever done? Are we trapped in the myths and the legends? Where are we? So to get to grips with that question, my first one is going to be about what our individual first access to Normandy was and where where it came from and did it influence our, 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 our study later on. In my case, I remember very clearly, it was when I received Max Hastings' Overlord book. I was 15 years old. And I loved it at the time, and I know it definitely influenced my thinking because it's from that era of the Germans were very formidable, we British and Canadians and Americans are a little bit hopeless. And I know it took me a long time to overcome some of that. I'm not saying that all of that is wrong necessarily. I'm just saying that definitely influenced how I came to understand the Normandy campaign. So I'll go with you, Mike, because you were the first here. What was your first um, you know, intro to the Battle of Normandy and did it shape your, your future studies? Yeah, well, thanks, for Paul, for having me on the show. I'm, I'm really happy to be back and, and I always love talking to your uh, very knowledgeable audience. Um, as a Canadian, I have to say, um, growing up and, and before I sort of became a serious student of military history, uh, D-Day and, and the Battle of Normandy wasn't really on my radar. Uh, as a Canadian, it was uh, Vimy Ridge and it was uh, Dieppe. And uh, Normandy wasn't something that was really there. And uh, probably the first time I really remember thinking about it or learning about it was in my grandfather's basement. And my grandfather was a uh, veteran of the Second World War, uh, served with the uh, 48th Highlanders in England and Northwest Europe, missed D-Day. But uh, he had a, a collection of books that whenever we went and visit, I would sit down there and page through them. And he had a, a two volume set on the, the Canadians at war. It was Reader's Digest and it had a, a couple of chapters on uh, D-Day in Normandy. And I remember looking through that and thinking, wow, this is a really cool story and uh, something I'd like to know more about, but I didn't really know anything about. And uh, it wasn't really until I got to university that I uh, started to look into uh, the battle and, and learn more about it. And uh, I remember taking uh, the, the Tuesday night at the movies course, History 247 at Wilfrid Laurier, and we'd watch uh, The World at War every week. And uh, that haunting theme is, is still in my head, but the, the Normandy episode is, is, is pretty good on, on what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, I've got to choose one of the Johns now. Let's go with John McManus in the USA. Your first influence of the, uh, on Normandy and, and did it affect your studies later on? Yeah, it's definitely affected practically everything. Uh, for me, uh, the first couple things I remember, of course, was Cornelius Ryan's The Longest Day, the book. Not really the movie. I mean, the movie comes along later for me because, you know, it wasn't in the theaters when I was a kid. It was well before then. And, you know, it's not going to be in syndication until later. So I remember just devouring the book and thinking also that there was much more to know. And I remember um, Robert Leckie had written a book called The Story of World War II. It had a fascinating cover. It had a, had a picture of Omaha Beach, a kind of panoramic picture of Omaha Beach. And just, um, you know, that that image stayed with me and made me want to explore more. Um, so it, there's no question that, you know, I, that all of that laid a foundation, certainly for my interest, uh, but also for whatever the narrative was that we think we know, you know, all these many years later. Uh, I haven't strayed from it, but there's no question but that that provides like a like a concrete foundation for whatever comes later. Yep. And and finally, John Buckley, uh, don't say overlord because I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was kind of a first introduction, I suppose, at the, the way we, we all tend to look at it. But I suppose uh, as a kid, the thing that um, first got me interested, one is my, my dad's stories about having been in the war even though it later transpired he hadn't been in the war, but at least he kind of piqued my interest in the whole subject. Um, 
but I, I there were two ways in it's in coming to normally for me um and both of them were from odd kind of angles the first was that um the first thing that really interested me in second world war was cornelius ryan but or the a film version of and that was a bridge too far when i was about 10 the film came out and i was absolutely captivated by it and the whole story the prelude to getting to Arnhem and Market Garden, of course, was the Normandy campaign. So that was one way back into it, because I wanted then to know, well, how they got to Market Garden and so on. So that was one way in. And then from that, I, I later on um, saw The Longest Day, uh, as John's already mentioned, um, and then Hastings and Overlord. So the other thing, and this is this came a bit later, my, my, my first life as a historian was as an air power historian. So I did lots of stuff on on the interwar period and air power during the Second World War, um, and then I, I I went on a, a trip to Normandy um, for with a then girlfriend um, to check the the place out and do the the kind of field trip option and so on, uh, and that kind of got me interested then because I only wanted to compare well why were the Allies so good in the air, and yet the literature and everything I was reading around me was saying that they're actually really bad on the ground. So there were kind of two ways into it, one from as, as a kid looking backwards from Market Garden and then this air power angle. And I wanted to understand what was the difference. But uh, that came a bit later, I suppose. But they're my two ways in. And then, of course, the literature that you're talking about, like Hastings and so on. Yeah. And the fact is, you know, uh, the second point we, we, we worked on in advance, folks, is that every time we go to a Normandy battlefield, it has been written about before several times in many ways in different with different opinions about it so that it's very hard to approach anything in normandy afresh there's always something that's been said about it before and that doesn't necessarily lend itself to objectivity and a fresh evaluation because you know again it's going to come up later on it, it's very simple well not simple it's very possible these days to write an entire 600 page book about the battle of normandy without using any primary source documents because you could simply just pull out all the existing literature and quote them and, and get all your opinions from caddy adams and james holland and carlo deste and and, and and john mcmanus and all the others and that is is perhaps lazy um and and certainly youtube is full of of, of those type things where it's just rehashing so in order to kind of understand where we are with the battle of normandy what kind of phases has it gone through in our interpretation you know because certainly the first era after war i think is you've got to look at that regimental history divisional history aspect um, I've got some of those sort of dusty tomes and what have you, and they are often written to celebrate the Battle of Normandy for the survivors of the campaign. So they're not particularly objective. They have a list. Some of them have lists of those who are decorated or those who are wounded or the fallen. That's quite interesting. But they're not necessarily looking at it in any kind of critical light. Um, and those clearly, those books ended up in all the library. They ended up in the Sandhurst libraries and the Wolverhampton libraries and the so and so West Point. How much did that? Uh, affect our our initial our initial understanding of the normandy campaign and and and, and ha did it and did it do so positively or negatively so i'll, I'll kind of go around in the same order M mike those sort of early histories what's your feeling about them yeah sure there's there's always the first stories coming out um the veterans telling their uh their memories and, and everything I, I think in many ways it was uh, basil littlehart that set the stage for our understanding of normandy he was one of the first off the mark to to write a book um to tell his version of it and his version was was really simple um monty was a, a great general um the germans were great soldiers the allies won because of of brute force and that's something that stayed with us and and is, is still a big part of, of our understanding of, of normandy but uh, yeah i think in many ways it was little heart that that set the stage and a lot of uh, a lot of writers have, have just taken their story from him yeah absolutely and and, I, and again one of the things that's going to come up in this is the generational aspect of it and that it's ended up that the this panel we're all i think within a few years about the same age which means when we first went to normandy we were probably looking at the same sort of books and the same sort of titles and it, it seems that there's been this these sort of waves of the the germans are the the formidable force phase then the the allies are the formidable force phase and so our what we took to the battlefields with us was being written by probably the previous generation. And now we are, I guess, engaging and writing for perhaps the next generation. And it's causing these things, these, these legends, these myths to be kind of repeated and regurgitated. But you know, I'll 
bring in John McManus. So, you know, this idea of the fact that nothing we write about with Normandy are we tackling for the first time. It's been written about before. Is, is that is that a bad thing or good? You know, does it mean that we're lacking objectivity? Well, certainly it challenges the objectivity. Um, I mean, at that point, you, you have to get deep into the historiography and attempt to master it all and then figure out where you fit. So, I mean, it's, in some ways, I think it, it could be good in that it, it pushes you towards originality. If you really want to say something, anything that's new or profound or important about Normandy, um, you really kind of have to get past the historiography. Um, and, and I think in one way we've done that, you know, we were talking about the the idea that the, the Germans are so formidable and, and the, the Allies were just kind of amateurs by comparison or however we turn that. Um, I, I personally think some of that comes from the original unit um, unit source material and veteran source material because you, you see a tendency to exaggerate, um, especially in, during the invasion phase itself, to exaggerate how many Germans are there, what they're about, how much they've got. Um, and I, so I think some of that kind of carries over. And I think it's also very appealing in the popular imagination uh, to think of this as like the ultimate obstacle, the ultimate uh, enemy you have to triumph over uh, rather than actually really looking at it in, in some level of depth. Uh, so, you know, for me, foundationally, too, I should mention the, you know, the official history like Omaha Beach mm. um, is, is another thing that that uh, that was given to me by my uncle. Um, who was not a, a, a Normandy veteran, but came in at Cherbourg many months after the invasion. And, and of course, the condition of the port made a deep impression on him. But he gave me Omaha Beach and said, this is the place really to, to start to understand this. And so I, I don't think I'm alone in that regard. Mm. I like what you said there, John, about about um, the, the the, the, the Germans being formidable, being part of the needed story. And John Buck, I'll ask you, because for every account we have from a German in Normandy, we have 19 or 29 from an Allied point of view. And I think certainly that goes through. I mean, I did my comics shows back last year, and the, the original commando and warlord writers were World War II veterans. The artists were World War II veterans. They'd grown up they, with this idea that Tiger Tank is scary, the MG-42 is, is, is the buzzsaw, all these, these tropes that they then wrote about that then influenced us. But the fact is, we just don't have the, the amount of accounts where the Germans are saying, my God, I was terrified of the typhoon. My God, you should have heard when the Bren guns started coming towards us. We've grown up hearing how the Allies are terrified of the German stuff. We've not had the same access to the Germans being terrified of, of our stuff. And therefore, that has been very influential in how we perceive the Normandy campaign. So, so John Bucky, to, to you, again, this, I, the fact that we're not tackling it fra fresh um, that has led to a lack of objectivity, and it has led to the problem we're in now, where we don't really know where the truth is. Is that is that? Would you agree with that? Um, yes, but well, that, that that's kind of the fun of history, isn't it? I suppose um, it's one of the things that you start off in history quite early on, thinking there is a truth, and then qu very quickly you work out there is no truth. It's about interpretation, and each interpretation yeah. is generational. Uh, and reflects the needs of the generation that, it, that, that, are, that is writing that history. So, I mean, as we already discussed, in the 50s and the 60s, there was a, a need or a desire to understand or come to terms with the Second World War. And so the, it's kind of a, a more of a memorialization or remembrance of something of uh, uh, those who fought in it and wanted to record their thoughts. And why we have, of course, the, there's much more on the Allied side is because they were the winners and supposedly on, on to many, they were the good guys, whereas Jim's the bad guys. And there's a degree of reticence about writing down their experience, which is entirely understandable and legitimate in, in, the, in the circumstance. You can understand why. Um, but the, the issue about historiography, whether it's a, a problem or the different phases of history or that the, there's always something to pick up on, um, it, it's kind of that creates one of the problems and issues about the way in which we write history for a, a try and write history for a wider audience in that publishers don't like historiography. They don't like us talking about different waves and types of history and so on. Mm. That doesn't really capture the imagination. Um, so we have to be careful about how we understand the historiography and how we use it. We use it in, in teaching, say, universities or whatever. Um, but getting out to a wider market is more difficult. And that's where there's, I think there's a problem that there's a lot of material written from the, the, the kind of early phases and so on, which has influenced and shaped the way people read about the subject. Um, but it doesn't understand, it doesn't get to grips very often with the historiographical aspects of it, why it was written in the way that it was, why 
in the 50s and 60s, we had one type of history. By the 70s and early 80s, it was different, and then how it's changed again. And the reasons and pressures behind all that, I, th I think some of which we'll explore. Um, but, I mean, I, I remember where I, um, I was talking about an introduction to a book I was going to do on the Northwest European campaign, and I wrote this really nice section about historiography, and the editor of the series said, no one's interested in that, just get to the story. <laughs> and so that creates a problem then because we want to tell that part of the story because it tells us where we are now. We have to understand the different phases to understand where we are now. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting, but it's a challenge of how to deal with that to an audience which often isn't exposed to that uh, because of the way publishers think. Mm. And I think that there's probably going to be the recurring theme that in order for us to progress, we need to assess where we've got to so far and understand the changes that have happened over the years and how, how they've influenced things. And I get there's a sense now with some of the interpretation of history that, that, that when things swing the other way, sometimes it's simply because it is the other way, not necessarily because the other way is the right way, but simply it has been told this way. Now, now let's swing that around 180 and now tell it the other way simply to get a, to get a reaction. Now that, that can't be healthy when you're simply looking for a reason to dismiss the earlier version to be different. Surely it's only dismissing it if it's worth dismissing. But in order to kind of progress through the, the themes we kind of talked about, Mike wanted to bring up this idea, and I think John Bucky, you kind of mentioned it there, the Cold War, because so much of our understanding, particularly from regards to the staff rides and the war colleges and Wolverhampton and Sandhurst and West Point and all that, is because when these officers were coming, and not just officers, the battlefields in the 60s and 70s, was it is it fair to say they were primarily coming to study Normandy to understand how Normandy could be used to fight the Cold War rather than for its own study in a, as a historical era? Is that fair? Um, Mike, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't quite understand where this whole idea came from, but it's very clear that um, as the Cold War developed, as NATO developed, um, and they were facing the prospect of, of war with the Soviet Union, um, they were trying to figure out how they were going to fight that kind of a war. And they grabbed onto the idea that we needed experienced people who had fought the Soviets and to teach us how to do it. And uh, so they looked to the Germans and uh, NATO very clearly thought that all things German were great, that German tactics, German commanders, um, everything like that. And so you see a very heavy reliance on uh, those German experiences to inform the NATO way of fighting the war. And uh, you see that uh, take place in a bunch of different ways in uh, bringing German officers to uh, to do staff rides with, with British army officers and American army officers. You see um, Kurt Meyer, who was convicted of, of murdering Canadian soldiers, was imprisoned in Dorchester, BC, but then is pulled out of prison to go and talk to the Canadian army and share his experiences and, and things like that. And it just seems very perverse. Um, I, I, like I said, I don't really understand why. I mean, at the end of the day, the Soviets uh, beat the, the Germans. Um, I think the allies came up with very good ways of fighting and they themselves beat the Germans. So why we needed to, uh, to, to follow their lead and understand what they were doing is, is problematic. And, and another part of it is that the German officers were all, all allowed, encouraged to tell their story after the war. So uh, the German officers that were in uh, allied hands were given the opportunity to write their histories. And of course, they told a very favorable history to themselves. They glossed over the, the bad parts. They emphasized the good parts. They um, loved to talk about the, uh, the power of allied uh, air power and how it stopped them from doing anything they wanted to do. Because of course, air power is the one thing that was out of their control. They couldn't deal with that. They couldn't affect it. So if it was air power that defeated them, well, then that was out of their control and they were still great uh, battlefield commanders. Yeah, and I just wanted to reference um, David O'Keefe's, as usual, to the on point comment there. You know, the, it was war studies rather than history. The former is what should have occurred, the latter is what did occur. And we're interested tonight in what did occur, not what should have, not the what ifs, not how we can use this to fight other wars, but simply what actually happened in 1944 so that we can write about it in the best way and talk about it in the best way. So, again, if, if either of the Johns, do you want to jump in on the Cold War aspect of it? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, the Cold War, but also just the staff rides in general. Yeah, um, it's it's taking history and attempting to apply that knowledge for some sort of professional development and purpose. 
Uh, so in that sense, I, I don't see Normandy as anything unique. Um, and when we just look at through that era, the 60s and 70s, of course, and 80s, of course, it's going to be geared toward the, the Cold War. Um, but there, there is, at least on the, on the U.S. Army side, um, there's one officer who is especially influential on, on the whole staff ride and, and uh, you know, Normandy as professional development thing. And it's uh, uh, Colonel and later General William DePay, who served with the 90th Division, which is a division that, of course, as you guys know, you know, took some serious lumps in the in the hedgerows and is a kind of a poster child to the, the lack of preparation. And so to pay, you know, sort of uses that kind of historical base point to argue for a, a, a better Cold War readiness posture and a better better training for Vietnam, of which he's, you know, quite influential as a staff officer and commander. Um, and so all of this, you know, whether it's Normandy or any other World War II battle study, um, ends up as a, as a very kind of applied kind of knowledge structure for what the, the armed forces are doing in the Cold War, too. Yeah, and and to, to bring in uh, John Bucky there as well, I mean, th this Cold War era, and particularly with what you do with your profession, you know, you you have, you you must be using a lot of those, that, that, that documentation created from that period, and uh, I'm interested to know, do you use it less now than you did? Than you? I don't mean you personally, but Wolverhampton, do you use it less now than you perhaps did 30 years ago? You know, what, what, tell us a bit about how that era affects your, your particular branch of work. Well, I mean, that one of the issues, um, we, I mean, part of it is we want to track about how, just as, as John and Mike were talking about, how the, the Cold War has influenced, because what we're interested in is, is, is as well, is understanding why they taught what they did when they did in order to understand why they then went on to shape what was then written about. And the two things are quite interlinked. And this is where it becomes, as the guy said, it becomes a problem um, because the, the demands of the Cold War shift and change. And uh, by the 70s, uh, there is a move towards uh, trying to avoid necessarily having to of uh, try, stopping trying to avoid fighting a war in Europe, but actually switching to a posture where you might actually have to do it. So if you have to fight a semi-conventional war, what's the best way to do it and what are the routes of success? And so quite rightly, the armed forces in NATO and so on start to pick out those issues um, in order to try and inform how they're going to develop things, what ultimately becomes your air land battle and all kind of um, bells and whistles kind of approach that starts to emerge in the late 70s and in, into the 80s. Um, now, the, the, the model or the, the framework and the theory behind that is, well, who else has fought the Soviets uh, when they have masses and we have small, but we have technical, technically better? Well, it's the Germans that so that's what we learn from. And that, that is where this fascination starts to emerge in terms of why uh, the uh, NATO forces start to become um, uh, fascinated by the way the Germans held up the Russians for so long. Part of it, I think, as well, is because um, those writers in the post-war years from Britain and America and Canada were looking at what their experiences in Northwest Europe, thinking, well, we had all this kid, we had all these advantages, and we still took a long time to beat the Germans. So what were they doing to slow us down? So again, there's this idea of cherry-picking bits of the experience in order to inform the future. So, it, you know, as John might was saying, it, it's quite purposive during that time. But the knock on for us becomes that people who then write about this stuff, like Max Hastings and so on, um, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, have fairly close links with that military interpretation of the Second World War. Uh, Max Hastings was a, a he, he uh, reported on the Falklands War, he went with the army, he had fairly good links with the army. And so they were telling him these stories about the, the the Second World War and what we learned from it and how we had to change the way we did things in order to confront the Russians in the future. And so this idea of the Germans really good and mission-based command, this is the, the kind of stuff you're always hearing about the Germans, out of tracks, tactic and so forth. That all starts to develop for me, it, uh, from my understanding, in that kind of 70s, 80s era, there's a real wish to use that um, experience of the Second World War to inform how a future war was going to be fought. And so charting that and understanding the, the whys and wherefores about why um, th those writers then came to write uh, what they did in the 80s based on the Cold War experience is really fascinating because that's how history works. And you're right, it switches 180 and goes in different directions and so on. And there's always a reaction to what was written beforehand. Um, but understanding where, where we got to by the 70s and the early 80s is quite important in understanding the whole Normandy story. 
Yeah, and I think I think Carlo Deste falls into that same category in my head as Max Hastings. I mean, the late great. I mean, he did some amazing. His pattern of biography, yeah. I think, is still ama- amazing. But it's it's of its place and of its time. And and I think what uh, while I'm listening to you speaking, it's encouraging to me that I'm assuming that the Battle of Normandy is becoming less and less relevant broadly to modern military forces, and because of everything having changed so much i know there's the basic principles of leadership and things like that that never change but the actual the connections as we move on what we learn you know it's like saying that we can understand roman tactics and and and, and, and deploy them today that world war ii is becoming going to become less relevant as we move forward with modern warfare so does that mean that maybe we are on the brink of actually now studying the history better and not looking at the war studies aspect of it? So rather than saying, what can we learn from this? Again, this re- understand what actually happened um, rather than why it happened. Um, so the next thing I want to bring up is the very nationalistic way it seems to me that normally has been written about and it continues to be written and discussed and that in that, Canadians seem to write for a Canadian audience, Brits for a British audience, Americans for an American audience, not exclusively. And certainly as a tour guide in Normandy, that is sort of how it is. You know, the Americans want to hear about Omaha Beach and 82nd and 101st Airborne. The Brits want to hear about Lord Lover and, and Pegasus Bridge. And the Canadians want to hear about... And that's understandable. Having a pride in one's country is, of course, understandable. But is it meaning that we're not spreading out and looking at the archives of other nations. And I want to get into language later on as well, but mm. I would like to think that even a simple discussion like this, where we're bringing in, in people from three countries and being watched by, I don't know how many different countries are watching us. I know there's people in Sweden and, and, um, and Europe watching us. Is that a good sign for the future of this sort of cross pollination and understanding each other's histories and kind of developing from that? I mean, you know, M- M- Mike, John, John, you all teach and lecture for your respective national audiences but is it is it a failing of ours to not be more um more international in our in our study who wants to jump in on that one let's go with john mcmanus this time okay yeah i'll jump in on that i mean i think a lot of it is i mean it takes one hell of a scholar to be able to grasp the entire international side of this, to, to present every point of view, to be able to do research in all the various archives. And if we're talking about truly making it international, let's talk about going beyond just the Germans, the British, the Canadians, and the Americans, uh, people from other nationalities involved, obviously the French and whatever. But, um, you know, I mean, it, I'm the last person to, to criticize anyone for a national focus because that's been my work on it. And really what it does it, it says a lot about my limitations that I couldn't claim to be a, a German scholar of any kind of standing to, to really get it deep into their archives. Now, at the same time, um, I think there's there's enough source material available in, in multiple languages that you, you ought to hopefully be able to show both sides of the hill if you're doing some combat history. And I think that's very important. Uh, but to give you the, the kind of bird's eye and international scope of the whole thing is, is quite a job. And so I think part of this is just the, the practicality of it. Um, and I also think when we're talking about visitation to Normandy of, of everyday folks, uh, you know, most of the time people are limited in how much time they can spend on site and they kind of prioritize their time and they're gonna tend to wanna see where their own countrymen fought. And of course, in many cases, they are descendants of veterans who maybe fought there um, you know, so so I think part of it is just Normandy is such an such a vast, enormous event and story uh, that it's very difficult to get it to get a grip on all of it. And you know, we were talking earlier about historiography and primary sources and all that. I mean, if you really want to do something original about Normandy, you ought to be deep into the original primary sources. Um, and you know, the the wider lens you pull back on this larger international side of it, the harder that is to do. Um, and so you end up, you know, going back into the secondary material and just sort of synthesizing what comes before, uh, I think, all too often as well. But but my uh, my admiration goes to, to out to, 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 to Max Hastings and others who have attempted to take on the whole battle from mer- many, many perspectives. Uh, I think that takes a great deal of skill and, and understanding as a whole. Yeah, and I think everything we're going to be talking about, we're in no way... Um, knocking all those previous studies. They're all part of the development of, of understanding where we are, but it's examining them for where they are, what they were trying to say, when they were saying it, who they were saying it to, and how we have moved on from that now. And, 
And there's a discussion going on about the fact we're not talking about the actual operations in Normandy. Well, we're not meant to be talking about the operations, but we've done that in other shows. We're talking about how we are where we are in our understanding of the Normandy campaign, because I feel I spoke to these guys before we went live that we are maybe hopefully on the brink of a kind of a new era of going back to basics and, and, and looking at these things with a fresh eyes. And I, I'm trying to do that, that now I'm, I'll tell you how I'm freed up now because I'm not doing a hundred times a, day, a year going to point to Hawk and telling those same stories. I'm going out and doing different shit. Just yesterday, me and Colin were out there and we found a monument we didn't know existed um, in Santoban Sommer that references the Holocaust. I didn't know there was a monument there that referenced the Holocaust, and it just started me going down a new way of thinking about something else. And I've done more div work into Charnwood and, and Epsom because I've got the time to do it, and therefore I can go and read sideways and look at other accounts. And I'm trying to what I'm doing now when I go to Battlefield is try and go there and say, look, pretend, Paul, you've never read anything about this before and try and kind of build up your story from scratch. Look at where the high ground is, look at what the objectives might be, and kind of make my own judgment about it, and then go into what has been written about it before. But as you said there, John, that takes time, it takes effort, and I think we, we want to get the results very quickly and produce our tours, produce our books, produce our lectures. So um, in terms of language, John Buckley, I mean, what, what with the with the internet revolution at Wolverhampton, do you now have more access to German archives, French archives, and other nations? Indeed, are your are your students changing? Uh, are they coming from a more uh, diverse <laughs> area as the years pass? Um, no, I'd like no. to say I'd like to say that they are or that we are, but but no, I mean, um, language teaching in the UK is, is really poor. Uh, and, and getting students to engage with different uh, languages. I mean, I'm saying this is completely hypocritical. I have kind of working French and a smidge of German, but not enough to, to do anything greatly in depth. Um, but the, the students we get, I'm, I'm, there's also an issue about what you can manage to do in the amount of time you have, even on a battlefield tour. We do an entire, uh, as part of our program, we, we have an entire course on a, a module within a, within a course on the Normandy campaign, uh, and we have a week long study trip to Normandy. Um, um, but in order to do it at kind of different levels and to engage with primary material and get to walk the ground and to compare different elements of it, we end up focusing really on a fairly small part of the campaign. And we're there for a week. You know, we do the, some of the big stuff and go to the um, go, go to the beaches and you know, the Pegasus Bridge and all that kind of stuff. But really, the, the, the meat of what we do is to follow the route of some of the operations for, I have to say, in the Anglo-Canadian sector, uh, which is always a beef with some of the students. Why aren't we going to the American sector? So we could, but then you start to uh, get a thinner experience of what it is that we're doing. Um, so we focus on the Anglo-Canadian sector. We follow particular units. We use primary documents and accounts of the, the veterans. We use photographs, maps, uh, and all that kind of stuff um, in order to follow the route through the Normandy campaign and tell a particular tale. But in order to do that in, in that kind of depth, you have to narrow down your scope. Uh, and just as John was saying in terms of, uh, as if we're writing about the subjects, you could spend a lifetime mastering all this material. There's a huge amount. Um, and it would be an enormous challenge to be able to get on top of all of it and tell the story from all different angles. Um, so it, that, that's a... Huge. The, the thing that I think is, is different in that, it, perhaps in the last 20 years, that there is more material now in, in German or German based sources, which tell us mm. a great. I know you're doing a, another show on this where you'll look at that. I think that's kind of a, a missing element because I'm still very Anglo American Canadian centric in terms of how we look at the subject. And it's interesting that, that our students experience is when they when we take this Normandy, they, we, we give them all the stuff beforehand. They've had lectures and seminars and tutorials. They go to the ground and then they look at the way in which it's presented in Normandy. And many of them still say, where's the enemy? That the Germans are kind of airbrushed out of this a little bit. I think there's maybe a move now to try and change that to a degree. Um, I, I mean, you can understand that you can explain the reasons why that is. Um, but for historians or trying to understand um, what happened on the ground, that, that's a challenge a little bit, but maybe there's some kind of progress in that area. But in terms of language and different sources, well, I mean, look, I mean, it, it's difficult enough to get undergraduates to read anything. So, you know, they, they want to absorb <laughs> things quickly and, uh, and get the kind of quick fix stuff. But, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, maybe... 
because I, I get accused sometimes by people who like me apparently of, of saying we a lot when I'm talking about Normandy. And mm. I and I try not to, but I can't help it. You know, my great uncle was there on Saw Beach with the Royal Oster Rifles. It, 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 we seems to fall into my head more naturally than the Allies mm. and then and and Germans. Again, it's them. But maybe that's because again, it's a generational thing. You know, the, the, the young tour guides in Normandy, they might be their great grandparents who are involved in World War II now, not just their grandparents and uncles. So maybe they won't have that same they, us at Mentor, which will mean that their studying of the events will be less influenced by their their desire to kind of feel good about their own country's involvement. I mean, Niels Henkerman, who's going to be on the show on Sunday, who's watching tonight, taking notes for the Sunday show, has been an absolute revelation. I mean, when his book comes out, I've seen seen it. We're sitting in Arnhem. I've seen the manuscript. It is just groundbreaking. The, the information he has breaking down the horses, the supplies, the machine guns in the German divisions is literally stuff we haven't seen before. And yet all he's done, I say all he's done, is spent hours and hours and hours in the archives going through their and being Dutch, he under, you know, speaks German, and pulling out these resources and putting it into understandable chunks so that us people who don't speak German can actually look at it and go, wow, amazing work there. So Niels is, is pushing things forward, and he is you know, 15, 20 years younger than myself. I'm not exactly sure how old Niels is. So he is a slightly different generation. But in order to kind of move this conversation onwards, I mean, I'm enjoying it, folks. And now that Russ guy has gone, because whether you were following the comments there, he just didn't get what we were talking about. Who are these people? What are they talking about? They know nothing. He's gone now. So we can just get back to those of us who understand what we're talking about. But I, I in general terms, where do you think you are and your understanding of Normandy now? Are you a, are you better than you were before? Are you more confused, John McManus? We, we've, we've talked about this, you, you know, I personally, I think I know less now than I did 20 years ago, but there's the potential to know more if that may, if that doesn't sound like a paradox. Um, so John, Mc, John uh, McManus, what's your feeling? Are you, are you, are you more, more understanding of it now or worse? Uh, I mean, I'd love to say more, but I, I gotta be honest. I mean, probably worse in the sense, I mean, you just, I, as, as the years have gone on, I have hopefully more and more humility about this that, uh, I mean, I, I guess my answer is I know quite a bit about some aspects of it, especially Omaha Beach, because I happen to do a book on that. And so, yes, I feel like I have a very firm grasp of some aspects of Omaha Beach. But one of the things that I think is interesting about Normandy is as, as this, you know, as we progress forward with more and more work done, I, I, get, I just keep getting a sense of more and more, not only what I don't know, but what I haven't thought of or what I haven't interpreted quite the same as someone else did. And that's why I really enjoy um, the fact that a lot of work is done on Normandy and to be able to bounce things off colleagues and hear their perspectives, I think it's really helped my own work. So, I, I mean, I wish I could say that, that you know, in 30 plus years of or more of immersion into this that I have really progressed to the point where I know it all, I'm not even close. Well, there's, there's a kind of a joke in Normandy that we say at the beginning of a tour season, when, when we have tour seasons, Will any of the stories have been poo-pooed since? Because you know, we get to the point where, well, that one's been dismissed now. That didn't happen. He wasn't there. You know, he didn't land there after all. He's a fraud. Uh, that tank didn't exist there. He was never in that battle. And you kind of think, is it anything we can actually fall back on for a previous year and, and fall back and say, is, can we can we can we move ahead with this and assume it hasn't changed? I mean, Pegasus Bridge, I don't think has changed much. Although we do seem to still keep, keep changing which all of the gliders land. I think Neil Barber's changed his mind on that one two or three times. I've changed my mind seven or eight times. But you know, Mike, when you come when when you come to Normandy again, having had you know we've all had a break. Well, apart, apart from that, I live here. From coming to Normandy, do you think when you come back to Normandy, things like these chats, things about reading more widely, will you be coming more better armed to look at Normandy in the future? Or do you think it'll be trapped in the same old myths? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that the more I learn about Normandy, the more I know that I don't know. Um, there's just so much going on. And um, I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of going back a little bit to what you're talking about with the national stovepipes. And uh, the first time I went to Normandy was the uh, the summer of 95. And I was on a, uh, I was a student on a Canadian Battle of Normandy Foundation study tour. And, and we stayed in Normandy. We were lucky enough to stay at the Abbey d'Ardenne for 
uh, a week. And uh, it, it was tough to find a Canadian footprint in, in Normandy. This was before the Juno Beach Center was built. Mm -hmm. uh, Le Memorial was there and you could, I'm trying to remember, I don't think there was a single mention of the Canadians in that museum. Now it's not a battle of Normandy museum per se, but uh, there wasn't a lot there. So I, I'm firmly in the camp that you need to be able to tell the bigger picture story to integrate it. Um, to bring in the Americans, the British, the Canadians, the Germans, the Polish, um, to tell the full story. But I also believe that you need to uh, tell your own story because if you don't tell it, nobody else will. And for a long time, there weren't a lot of people telling the Canadian story. Now, uh, that's changed drastically um, lately. Um, John English, uh, Terry Kopp, Mark Milner um, are some of the, the, the names at the forefront, but the, the story is much more fully told. Uh, David O'Keefe has made some significant uh, contributions. There's lots of great stuff out there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if a historian doesn't have humility, there's something wrong with them. Um, I think you have to understand that you can only ever know a portion of the story and you have to go out and try to tell that story to the best of your ability, but know that you can't be definitive and know that somebody's going to come mm -hmm. along and they're going to poke holes in it or they're going to... Uh, add detail or, or add depth to what you're telling. And uh, you can only hope to tell a, a story that captures a, a moment in time. Yeah, and I think I want to reference again what the Great Dominion said there, which he said, you know, just wondering if the guests think we are reaching a point of diminishing returns with rega regard to the academic study of the Battle of Normandy, i.e. is it becoming boring old hat? And my initial response to that is, it could become boring if we don't dig down and go back to the basics again. If we do just stick within the myths and stick within the, the, the accepted narrative, yes, I think there's a tendency of it becoming boring and old hat. But I think if we're brave enough to strip away and go back to basics, and for those who didn't watch it, go back and watch the show Marty Morgan and I did about the John Steele story in Sam Murray Glees, where basically nine words in an interview that he sent to Cornelius Ryan exploded an entire story and most of the stuff knife being dropped blah 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 was out of Cornelius Ryan's head and I'm saying that as a great a, a huge respect for Cornelius Ryan I think he was a great um um a storyteller he he, he he his archives were amazing but it, it started from almost nothing and when you strip back you go but it, it there's not much to this story so I think from my point of view, and I'm the least academic of the four of you, four of us, we've got us, we've got to be brave enough to go back in, like people like David O'Keefe have done, like Mark Milner have done, and Jonathan Ware on Twitter, who I, who's coming on the sun, who I think is an absolute revelation with how he's stripping back things like the examination of the Luftwaffe and air power, and you know he. I, I, I read his threads and I go, he is he is making me look at things from a completely different point of view in just. You know, 200 characters in a tw tweet. And I think people like Jonathan, who is, I guess, the next generation, will be pushing things on. So in order to, I think, to be, get, take a bit more, uh, not fun, the conversation, but I think one of the key questions I want to bring up now is, are some of the myths about the Normandy campaign, tropes, legends, whatever you want to call it, are they now so deeply entrenched that nothing we're going to do is going to change them? And my example on that, and I'll bring it to you, is the fact the academic world accepted years and years ago that Napoleon was not short. An academic keeps saying he wasn't short, you know, he was average height or a bit above, but the world has decided he was short, damn it. And every time you see him in a cartoon or a skit or a film, he has to be portrayed by a guy with his knee, you know, his knees and his boots being short. So is there some is there something with the Normandy campaign that is now we are stuck now with this idea that every German has an MG forty two and every tank was a tiger or can can we will we move beyond those I'll bring I'll bring um, John Buckley in on that are, are we stuck with those or is there hope There is hope uh, there is hope it, it it depends on how entrenched. Um, a, a story of a campaign or a battle becomes embedded in uh, kind of a, a becomes part of a national myth. And I think some things have reached that level, which it doesn't matter what historians say. It doesn't matter what primary research you do. It doesn't matter how you present the fact. Well, that's clearly not true. There, there are other angles to this or you can interpret it a completely different way. And it's all been shaped and everything by, you know, passage of history over, over many decades and so on. There are some things which you cannot shift. And I would 
the First World War lines led by donkeys. It doesn't matter how many times people like Gary Sheffield and so on in this country go on about that. No one's ever going to listen. It was lines led by donkeys and that was it. And so I think that is embedded in the national myth. You could say something about um, Gallipoli and uh, the, uh, you know, the birth of Australian national identity and so on. And in some cases, it gets beyond being the historical reality or the historical interpretation. It's about what it represents and means. I don't think Normandy has that. There are certain elements where it's difficult to shift people's views on things. But um, I think you can detect in the writing uh, and the presentation of the story to the wider audience, and that, that's always an issue about um, some academics just write for other, other academics, some try and write for a broader audience, and then you've got other people who write for a, a bit much bigger audience, and it's how that interacts a little bit. And I, th I think Normandy is a bit more fluid, and I think there are, there are some changes uh, which we can see and have seen. And part of that is, is going back to sources and learning about um, different interpretations and then bringing something fresh to the story. And I think people have done that. Um, and I, I, we do learn from each other about how that works and it forces them to reevaluate what were um, what we were previously read or written uh, about a subject. And you, you can learn from others. I mean, Mike was saying about um, the work done on the by the Canadians over the last 20, 25 years on trying to reestablish or uh, to emphasise um, the, the Canadian story in Normandy. And I think, the, for me, that was a, a really important experience in driving British historians to start looking at the subject of the, the Normandy campaign in a big way. And in particular, I, think I, I saw Terry Cop give a, a paper at a conference grief 25 years ago and he took an, a, a quite a different approach to the way in which we looked at our subject a lot of our understanding of normandy is based on anecdotal evidence and stories and which have been passed around and people don't go back to the the primary accounts to dig into well what actually happened there like you you know you were just explaining mm -hmm. example before and i think when you get into that and you start to look at primary documents uh, such as i don't know operation research records and things you start to get a different understanding of what is actually going on in the on the battlefield of Normandy. Then the trick is to um, try it, uh, try those ideas out in a wider audience. The one thing I would say that I, I, I've tried to battle a long time, and that is that, that the famous story that all German tanks in Normandy were fantastic and all Allied tanks were crap, and uh, you just got blown out of the uh, off the ground all the time, uh, which is clearly not true. Um, and there's much more to it yet. It, you will still see it coming back at you all the time. So I've hammered but away. That, but that I, is starting to take hold now, isn't it? I think there are people now coming. So that one, I think there's some some mm -hmm. hope. I mean, sorry to cut you off mid-flow there. I just wanted to know as well, because it's very important, that Normandy is the most battlefield toured of all the battlefields in World War II. There are an unbelievable 150 of us in Normandy who, mm -hmm. in a normal year, make our living take talking about D-Day. And even myself, and I'm kind of rather senior, kind of been here longer, kind of like to think I'm really respected. There's those days you go out and you think, how much can I challenge these people? Because at the end of the day, they are paying me and they are paying me to have a good day out. Mm -hmm. And you think, and there's some days where I think, no, they're not going to, they, they, they don't want anything beyond the longest day history. And you nudge them a little bit and you, 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 you test it and you think, now I'm not going to get any of these things to hold, you know. That you know, you, you kind of, kind of. I, as a Brit, I mentioned Montgomery and see how that goes down. And I, and if if I can't, if I don't think I'm going to be able to win the battle, I just kind of, I don't bother. And now maybe that's my prop. Maybe that's me being not strong enough. But the thing is, they're not students. They're not. They've not come to me to learn. They've come to me to have a good day out. Now, other days, conversely, I think, oh, these, 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 these like these, these are like sponges. These ones, I can say, okay, we throw out what you think you knew, and now let's go. And you can build them up from scratch. But you have to get them to admit, as I have had to have done, that some of the stuff in their head is wrong, and none of us like like doing that so i have to say that as as part of the normandy guiding profession we have been as guilty as anything else of perpetuating the myths because it's been easier to, to perpetuate the myths to get the smile and the tip at the end of the day than it is piss people off you know because especially as a brit you know you, you have to be very most of our customers are americans so you have to be very careful to say you know when they say are oh, you brits fucked up con i go well 
okay, you fucked up San Lo. Are we quits now? You know, <laughs> I don't say it quite that bluntly, but you know what I mean. You can't, you, you, the field, you, you want to sort of meet them somewhere. But anyway, that I think is a point that the normally in the touring industry has been a both a positive influence and a negative influence on it. But the cliches, John, because I know John McManus is this stuff, because I know, you know, you've talked about Omaha Beach. So if there is a sector of Normandy that is kind of cliche ridden, it is Omaha Beach. Um, so what's your feeling on that and kind of perpetuating the myths? And I'm guessing, you know, when you're teaching history, your people have seen Sabian Pratt, right? And they've seen Band of Brothers and they've probably now played Call of Duty. So how does that affect you then building them up and saying, you know what, here's what actually happened? It affects dramatically. I mean, I, I was going to say I'd love to be optimistic that we'll get past the myths, but I'll believe we're past the myths about Normandy on the very day when I see the John Steele paratrooper dummy come down from the church in San Mary <laughs> That's when yeah. I'll start to get religion on this. Uh, because to me, what the, the whole game here is when it ends up on in a film of some sort, Band of Brothers, Longest Day, Private Ryan, whatever it is, it's immutable almost. And, and I, you know, and of course I'm constantly butting my head against this and the way I try and joke with my students or whomever is say, you know, this is why no one likes to watch these movies with historians because we're obnoxious and pointing out that's wrong. That's wrong. This is wrong. <laughs> and of course, yeah. 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 We've all been there. Yeah. yeah. Or, or maybe, maybe more fairly spoken, a little of it goes a long way, you know? And so you kind of, kind of pick your, pick your battles. And I, I think Paul, what you said, a moment ago is definitely dead on these things we have in our head, uh, you know, as that's what happened. It's very difficult to move someone away from that. And that's not just Normandy, that's life. Um, you know, yeah. maybe at a time when critical thinking is sort of on, uh, you know, in the ICU. It's a dirty word, isn't it? Critical thinking is a dirty, but yeah, yeah. What do you mean yeah. you want to think about something afresh? How, how dare you? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we can uh, overemphasize how much uh, Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers have um, grabbed the, the, the popular perception of, of people's understanding of Normandy. And uh, I know I, I always use that first scene in, in Saving Private Ryan and in explaining Juno Beach. And I tell people, well, what you're seeing there is only one small part of one beach. And uh, then tell the story about how uh, lonely it was for um, the, the Queen's Own Rifles landing at Bernier Stromer, and uh, there was only one boat every hundred yards, and they could barely see each other, um, which is a very different experience than people um, conceptualize. So, yeah, there's a it, it's like the salmon swimming upstream. We've got to yeah. work hard to, to get where we want to go. When you're on Omaha Beach, and I'm sure we've all done it, Saving Private Ryan is the elephant in the room that if you don't mention it, someone will. So, you, I, I kind of just invite the elephant in really quickly and say, Let's talk about the you know, let's talk about the movie quickly, talk about why it made some of the decisions it did to make the beach smaller because of fitting on screen, why it put the bluffs higher, why it put the guns in the bunkers it did. To, and, and now, come now we've kind of done that and we, we acknowledge what a visceral scene that is and how powerful it is and how how the storytelling of that is still very impactful. But now can we kind of put that aside and now look at actually what the terrain of Normandy of Omaha Beach was like and what the Germans actually did with their weapons and so on and so forth. But if you don't mention it, and I think this is the crux of it is because I'm I'm coming purely at this from the commercial kind of side of tourism. And you know, I'm not the academic. I don't teach it. I simply make money. Well, I used to uh, talking about D-Day. And I think it's the it's the merging of the academic world and the popular world and embracing the fact that video games and, and TV shows do influence people's understandings. And I've had historians who've proudly told me that when they get an email from like a video game company, that they just delete it. You go, well, then that's that I think is a mistake because you have the potential. And I know John McManus, you're working on some 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 video board gaming and video games. If you don't get involved, they'll do it wrong on their own. So you'd be better to get in there and try and influence things. You won't get you won't win most of the arguments, but you'll win some of them, and you can make things push things on. So I think we have to acknowledge if we're going to move on with our understanding of normally that we've got to move on a combined combined you know, on, a, on a broad front to kind of quote from Eisenhower there we've got to use educational teaching popular writing video games YouTube channels and everything to push the narrative forwards and not rely on one of those things to do the work for us otherwise we're going to get stuck and if academics just speak to academics 
yeah. it's yeah. not going to help. So yeah, totally. what are the, just kind of to liven things up, what are the things that really annoy you individually that are, that, that about the nominee campaign that we just can't move on from? I mean, in my case, it's the MG42 is no Maha Beach. It's, it, thanks to Nick Bard. That's got that in my head now. I can't now not think about that. And snipers, I think, is the other thing that just really annoys me, is that every single rifle shot that rings out in a popular book was from a sniper, and that just gets on my nerves. But my, Mike, what, what are the things that that annoy you, and maybe how can we move on from them? Yeah, that's that's an easy one for me. It's the uh, the emphasis on the Germans, on their uh, their cool kit and their awesome tanks and their amazing uh, machine guns. And uh, because of that, they are great soldiers. Well, you know what? I have something to tell you. They lost. They got pushed out of Normandy. They weren't there at the end. And uh, how is that possible? How could these terrible British and Canadian and American soldiers have actually won? So there's got to be something going on under the scenes that... Uh, some people don't like to talk about that, and uh, it's not that the Germans were awesome at war. They had their good points, they had their good days, but they had way more bad days than good days, and and that's what we need to talk about. Yep, and um, and and John McManus. Yeah, I agree, hundred uh, percent. That is what sticks in my craw. I, I've long ago rebelled against the sort of uh, Van Creveld. Uh, interpretation of the, the Germans are just incredible at the at the tactical level because the the battles I've studied and it's a lot of them that's just not really the case. Um, and I think Mike's point is exactly right. Well, they lost. Okay, so why did they lose? And, and one of the major reasons they they lost is they, they quite often were not as good at the tactical level. Um, so you know I, that whole idea of um, of the Allies just simply overwhelming the Germans with material power, and that's how they won the war. And Normandy is a kind of embodiment of that. Um, I think is such a misinterpretation and, and um, incorrect view of what happens in World War II that it almost mirrors, from an American perspective, the view that the North just sort of overwhelmed the South, and that's the only mm -hmm. reason why the North won the war. And all this material power, um, it really ignores the fact that human will is what what wins or loses wars ultimately and that the side with a lot more stuff sometimes loses uh like in vietnam would be a i was really gonna say cough vietnam cough yeah <laughs> so there's more to it than just that and that that whole inevitability thesis which normandy is a big part of that oh well you know once you have the big three together um the allies are just simply going to win the war that's just the way it is it's all over this this sort of I, I think that's really a kind of insult to every Allied soldier who fought in Normandy and had to sacrifice a lot to, to, to make that battle turn out the way it did. Mm. And John Buckley, uh, the, what, what gets yeah. on your nerves? Um, I, I mean, I totally agree with what the guys just said, um, that that's the, that's the kind of myth, that's the, the monster that we, we spend years trying to tackle to get people to, to reevaluate, to re-understand, to, to, to understand um, better what Normandy was actually like uh, to try and get to the sources to show to, and to me, for me is to show the soldiers' experience where possible and to show uh, to make that link to who these people were. Um, there's this uh, idea that yes, the, you know, the Germans are great um, soldiers and uh, they had all the best cards and it was a sheer weight of numbers and so on. But actually, I, I think you can show through getting to. Uh, particular battles, actually the Allied armies, the Allied units, uh, they might have started uh, in a kind of a rough kind of way because they were still finding their way, but how quickly they learned, how quickly they adapted and tracing that uh, adaptation, tracing those changes and their flexibility, the way they talked to each other, the way they shared ideas and how they improved their techniques uh, and tactics and capabilities as the campaign went on. And that's something which kind of annoys me that the, and this is down, down to, as uh, I think Mike was talking about before, about wheeling out Kurt Mai saying, oh, the UIs were hopeless. We were really great soldiers, but we, you, you really didn't learn anything. Just the same thing, the same old way. And then you show uh, uh, people in the Normandy campaign, well, let's look at Epsom um, uh, and then let's look at Total Eyes. And are you telling me that this is an army or that hasn't adapted, hadn't learned, hasn't brought new techniques? And that's the story to try and get through that. Um, Yes, the Germans had some strengths in certain kind of areas, partly born of experience, but the Allied armies actually adapted and showed uh, real skills and adaptability um, to, to the campaign that they were being forced to fight, often with soldiers who really, they got on with it, they did what they were told uh, for the most part, 
they learned, they made the best of the situation they were in, but actually um, they weren't hardened, bitter killers or anything. They were, they were um, uh, the most got conscript soldiers who were there because they thought they had to be and just to get the job done as quickly as possible. And you need to understand that context about yeah. what happens in Normandy. And then you start to understand uh, uh, the more complete picture, I think. Are we trapped a little bit in the fact that nuance isn't very interesting? Nuance isn't sexy. In the, when we talk about the Germans in Omaha Beach, for example, it seems to me we, we have to flip between the 352nd were an elite division or they were completely hopeless and the German defense. And it's like, well, can't we find so, the, the, the actual correct interpretation, which is there somewhere between the two? Can't, but, but that doesn't... Publishing a book on the 352nd Division, theoretically saying they were okay, they weren't the best, they weren't the worst, doesn't sound very appealing. But saying they were a formidable unit of Russian veterans who were the, that sounds much better. Or conversely, saying they were terrible, they were kids, they were terrified, also sounds better. So, are we are we struggling with this idea that the nuanced approach, and as you say there, John Bucky, the idea of of not showing the developments. Are, the thing is, but they're not made. The developments are clearly there, and that's where, when you look at this, to me, as studying it operationally, you can't just look at Epsom or Totalize or Tractable or Goodwood. You have to look at them as a big series of of gradual changes. But then that then takes time, doesn't it? Then you can't do that in half an hour. You know, I mean, I, I've I've tr tried to tackle on some of my World War Two TV TV shows with David O'Keefe and Mike Bechtel. We tried to ta tackle Totalize and, and Operation Spring, and you realize even an hour and a half. You're only just scratching the surface. And so it's easy to just kind of fall into the traps of, oh, well, the Germans are brilliant here and we were crap. Because it's 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 easy to make a conclusion quickly. So I, I think if we're going to push on, we need to accept this idea of, of nuance may not be very sexy to publishers. So how do we convince publishers and how do we convince tour groups and indeed classrooms to not go for sensation? What has anyone got an opinion on that, or am I just rambling? I think we, I think we couch it in terms of, um, hey, do you actually want to learn something new about something that already interests you and something that you know is important and you have a passion about? Well, here is an original, <laughs> an original viewpoint or original nuance. This is more reflects reality because in the end, a lot of people, you know, who are attracted to the story in Normandy. Um, you know, really do want to know more about what it was like and do want to have a sense of some kind of cutting edge viewpoint on the battle that happened 75 plus years ago in which a lot of work has been done. Um, I think if yeah. there's any way to get past this, it's the idea that I'm giving you something fresh that, that now you're in on this too. Maybe study it more. Someone's nose got out. Um, but that this comes back to that original idea that we started at the top of the show really of going back to basics and starting again and kind of throwing out all the pre preconceived ideas and building up the narratives from scratch again. And that is going to take time and it's going to take a new generation of people who want to put that effort in. I mean, it took, yes, it took me and Marty Morgan two hours just to discuss John Steele. So if you want to discuss Cobra, for example, how long would that take to strip that back to basics and say, right, Goodwood, I think, is probably the, the, the most in interesting British example of a battle. And I know I, I love your, your book, John Monty's Men and the British Armour in Normandy, because Goodwood, again, comes with all this baggage of, you know, was it a victory? Was it a defeat? Was it a draw? But when you go back to basics, you know, what did Dempsey say? What did Montgomery say? You realize that you've got to wade through everybody else's opinions first. And and that is that's the difficulty, isn't it? So so um what what's the hope? What what do we think can happen? What what, what will the next generation of historians have to do to move things on? I, I mean I think that they have to, uh, we have to tailor our story or tailor the way we approach our subject um, to those who are listening uh, and we have to be much better at it. Historians are really bad with the worst people in the world to give definitive black and white answers on things because you're taught from quite early on, there isn't a black and white answer, it's always nuanced, it's always maybe, possibly. And exactly what you're saying about Operation Goodwood, the number of times I get students saying to me, well, was it a success or a failure? I said, well, it was both really and neither. You know, it was somewhere between the two. It achieved certain things but failed in others. Um, but I, I, I also think that the the way we convey um, the, the, 
the idea of telling people something you're or getting across a different interpretation depends on who's listening. And I say that because I, I, when we were talking before about um, feature films and so on, as people bring their learning from feature films or TV series and things, I've increasingly found with undergraduates, and I don't know if anybody else had the same experience, because uh, I imagine it's a slightly different market to the, 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 the battlefield market, um, that they haven't seen a lot of the films about the Second World War. I get people starting the, the, the Normandy course who've never seen The Longest Day. Most of them haven't seen Saving Private Ryan. They're getting their information, their input from somewhere else. So if we want to shape that, exactly what you're saying about computer games and so on, if that's where they're getting their first grip of the subject, that's where we've got to uh, funnel some effort into engaging with that in order to shape that story a little bit, or at least guide it to a degree. Um, and you see all sorts of different markets, different, um, uh, different ways of uh, engaging with the subject are important. I find history students are different to war study students. Um, but different age groups. I've, I run a master's course on, on Second World War, and we talk about this particular campaign, the, Nor the Northwest European campaign. Most of them have seen all this stuff. They've already read a lot of these things, and that they're more of kind of the battlefield market, I think. Um, but lots of people are coming to the subject from different areas, and we, we need to be able to shape our message to meet how they're learning, and things like the internet and YouTube channels and so on, are, um, I guess now, are a much more effective way of getting to a wider audience than the way we originally thought about it as being it was all about TV channels or feature mm. films. So I don't think it is anymore. We must be more fluent about it. Well, I mean, I had Mike Buck, uh, uh, Mark, Mark Forsdyke on a show June last year about the first Suffolk's in Normandy. And very briefly, he said there was someone in his office who knew he'd been writing a book about the Suffolk's for 10 years, never shown any interest in it at all, but did sit and watch the program with me on YouTube because it was YouTube. Yes. And, and that was kind of like, is there that sort of person? Literally, there is this person who would never pick up a book but would watch YouTube. And clearly there is. And I'm I'm actually very impressed. Son, and Mike's done probably the most well, John's done a John Matt's done a few shows with me. The level of knowledge among people watching is really high. Sometimes I read questions out, I don't understand them myself. It happened on the electronic warfare one with Tom Withington about the, the RAF. It was I'm reading out, so I don't know what any of those words mean in, in, individually or certainly in context. So I'm a, I, there are people out there who know their stuff. There are people out there who want to know more. And there are people who are prepared to put the work in to get to that. But whether there are, that's the, the, the large audience, I don't know. I mean, I don't want a large audience. I'd rather have an audience of people who actually care and want to, know, want to know more than have a large audience where I talk about something for five minutes. But, you know, Mike, you know, you, you, you're, you, 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 you're, you're big on maps as well. So I think you've got a very good um, eye for how to get convey information to people in a readily absorbed way because of you know as a cartographer that is all about clarity isn't it so in yeah. your lecturing and your in your work where do you think the next what the, what's the next step how can we improve our understanding of the battle of normandy yeah i am um, kind of going back to your point of, about academics and I've, I've been a firm believer for a long time that academics can't speak just to academics that you get kind of this uh, echo chamber going where um, they're hearing each other and responding to each other, but the knowledge isn't getting out there. And when they do try to write for the general public, they do it in such a way that it's inaccessible, it's unreadable, it's uh, indecipherable. And uh, I think the first thing that academic historians have to do, because there's a lot of good academic historians, a lot of good um, master's students and PhD students that are doing fantastic work, but they're writing it in such a way that it's not um, readable by the average public. Um, it's too deep, it's too in-depth. I'm, I'm not trying to um, minimize the, the average reader, but they just don't have the interest in, in, in diving down into it. And they don't write in a way that's interesting enough to encourage you to keep reading. And uh, I, I think of people like uh, James Holland, who is such a uh, fabulous read, uh, writer. Um, David O'Keefe has figured out how to do this, how to uh, write with uh, the, the depth of knowledge, the use of primary sources, telling a new story, but doing it in a creative way, doing it in an entertaining way, doing it in a way that makes you want to keep reading instead of gouge your eyeballs out uh, because you just can't uh, bother going for another page. So I, I think we need to find a way to tell our stories better. And uh, I'm teaching a course right now and I'm, I'm trying to, to get my students to write in a, in a more accessible way. And 
one of the assignments I've, I've given them is you have to write a soldier's biography, but you have to do it as a Twitter thread. Um, and that, mm. that was earth shaking for some of them because they'd never had to, to think about things in, in 280 character bites before. And uh, they just knew they could throw it down on the page and get the story out there and, and they're done. But um, Twitter, Twitter is a wonderful uh, tool for teaching because it, it makes you uh, value every word, every character, and uh, you have to parse the story down to its, its basics, but also make it entertaining because people have uh, like a, a microsecond attention span. If you don't catch them in that first tweet, you've lost them. So you have to be interesting, you have to be engaging, and you have to be succinct. And, and those are things that uh, we can all uh, take value from. And yeah. that, you know, maybe another discussion for the future is the fact that with conventional TV work is we all know that the BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5 will use the same voices, the same talking heads all the time. and It'll be of a particular generation. And there's nothing wrong with those people. But I'm finding some of the particularly the PhD type students that are coming into my channel. I've just made contact today with a girl in, in, in Cor, in fact, who's going to talk about French tanks in 1940. And, you know, and they're fresh. They've got new ways of thinking about things. And they're from a generation where they can communicate cons quickly and concisely because they've grown up. It's cliche about, but, but it's, you know, they have learned that. It's text messages, it's emojis, it's, it's Twitter. They, they, they can communicate concisely. And I think perhaps the old generation, the kind of Martin Middlebrooks and the Max Hastings, who needed 3,000 words to say what someone like Jonathan Ware can now say in a good Twitter thread. And so it's embracing, embracing these, these ways of moving forward uh, so that we can understand things. But it's, it's a question of will we have to, again, throw out some of the preconceived ideas to go back? And, and how, how much um, enthusiasm have we got to go back and throw out some of the old accept, uh, the accepted narratives to find the new ones. And, and I think my, you know, what I want to say is we'll have to do it collectively. I think if it's, if it's done individually, it will end up falling into traps again. We've got to push forward again on this broad front with us in platforms like this, just talking amongst each other. I learn so much talking to other people because it just has made me realize, you know what, Paul, you've been thinking about that the same way for 20 years. And you've got stuck. You've got stuck on those set of tracks. And now someone's just kicked you off those tracks and you're realizing you're looking at something at a different point. David O'Keefe, for example, is, is, is very 180 in the way he looks at things. And yet, in very traditional, in a sense, he's using archives. It's, it's, kind of a, it's a happy medium, isn't it? But, you know, we're coming up to you know, an hour and a half now. Where, where closing, what, what hasn't come up in tonight's show that you would, like, would have liked to have come up or, or rather... What's the what point would you like to make individually about where we are and your observations of it, the historiography of, of Normandy? Yeah, let's let's go with uh, John McManus first. No, I was hoping to go with someone else because I had nothing <laughs> in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can switch. I'll go to John Buckley then. Oh, to John. thanks very much. Yeah, that's good. Um, Drop past, past the button. There. Ball there, I think. Um, I think I, I for me the thing that. Um, is going to be interesting over the next few years is the um, the way in which we engage with a non-nationalistic way of looking at the Normandy campaign. And I think the way in which um, we look at uh, the German army and the German armed forces in Normandy is something which perhaps needs to be engaged with far more. Uh, I'm not the person to do it, but I know there are people working uh, in the areas you said, and we've seen so much more um, over the last few years, but it's kind of an unwritten story, or has been to a degree an unwritten story. Understanding what's going on in the German army beyond the kind of the classical um, Max Hastings, Carl Dessé interpretation um, is something that's going to be interesting and challenging for us. Um, and I think that also then reflects upon the way in which we think about what we've written uh, amongst all of us or the way we approach subjects over, uh, over the last few years. Um, because we, we should always be in a position of having to learn to, to think again about what it is that, uh, that, that we published or written about or, or, or delivered talks on or whatever. Um, and to engage with that kind of reinterpretation of what it is that we've done is critical to, to moving the, the subject forward. And I think we have to be open to that. It's very difficult uh, when you get to a certain age, they say, oh, I'm not, I can't learn you know, new stuff or get engaged with it too much. But we have to because all the time, um, as you say, people come up with uh, different interpretations, um, which forces to reevaluate our understanding. And if we think everything's static, we fall into the same traps as those guys from 40 years ago who shaped the understanding for generation 
and then nothing move, we've got to be able to be, be more adaptable. So I think a greater engagement with things like the German story will be important yeah. over the next few years. Um, when I interviewed Frank McDonough about his sec uh, second part of his n Nazi history, I loved the fact he said, and I know my book will be outdated in ten years, out of date in ten years, and maybe five years. And that's the whole point, he said, because I think that was very refreshing. Because I think whoever has written a book about anything, you know, John McManus, your book, Fire and Fortune, you know, award winning, there's that kind of pride of I'd like that to be the definitive book on it. But the fact is, it won't be because someone in ten years or twenty years time will go, you know what, you you missed that bit there. You should have done, and that's how it should be. I mean, I, I'm going off on a tangent there, but you know, where. Paul Simon, Sounds of Silence, the, the, you know, the 60s hit, when the Disturbed, that heavy metal group, did that really dark version of it, he wrote a congratulatory letter to uh, Paul Simon did saying, what an in interesting direction you took that song, well done to you. And I think we've all got to be a bit more like that. But when I hear younger tour guides saying things in a way that I wouldn't say it myself, say, well, yeah, well done. Well done for taking something I said, throwing it at keeping the bit you liked perhaps, but adding to the bit that you, you, you thought was relevant because not, as we always say, none of this, this, this isn't our history. None of it is ours. We are talking, we're, we're making a living off the backs of people who died for their countries. So if that hasn't made us or shouldn't make us just humble uh, enough to accept that we've got things wrong and that we've learned. And I, I, if I could look at a videotape, thank God there isn't one of my first tours 25 years ago, I probably would vomit with, with, with horror at the rubbish I was talking about, you know. No, but it's, it's a compliment if, if someone is using your work and going beyond it. Um, I mean, that is the whole point, that you're, you are advancing history and moving it forward somehow, uh, mm -hmm. advancing knowledge. I mean, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, what I hope going forward is that there's a lot of younger people, and this seems to be happening, uh, but I mean, just like the, the college students and, and graduate students of tomorrow who will come to the Normandy topic and still have the same fascination with it and immersion in it and, and be moved by it, the human drama of it, um, and yet and yet not be stuck in the in the sort of myths of the past uh, and, be, and have a bit of more of an open mind about it, about how to, to move the story forward and to, to know more about it. I mean, it's very difficult to have both because you could say, well, what appealed to me about it was John Steele, you know, hanging on the, on the church steeple or something. I mean, you know, I hope that, that we'll have that happy medium. I really do. Mm -hmm. what, it, what it reminds me of in a way is like, quick, what do you think of when you think of George Patton? You kind of think of George C. Scott in the movie. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I yeah. hope that we can have that sort of initial passion that comes from that movie. And but then maybe the real knowledge, you know, beyond the mythology of the movie. Uh, and one thing that didn't come up, and I'll let Mike and uh, speak in a minute, is that we didn't talk about the the um the usefulness or otherwise of veterans accounts and testimonies and all of us here we grew up you know sitting at the knee of relatives who taught us about things and 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 that affected how we learned about it and understood about it and and, and i a piece of me dies when i find out that a veteran i sat and listened to wasn't quite what he said he was and it's happened quite a few times and 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 i feel this part of my heart kind of crumbling away but i sat at that guy and i listened to, with bated breath every word he said but of course the next generation won't have that same connection maybe they'll be free of those restraints of it being our uncles our grandfathers our great uncles and that's this sense of wanting to pay tribute to them and we we can look at some of the divisions and say, you know what, perhaps they didn't perform very well. Perhaps that lot weren't as well trained as they could have been without feeling that we're crapping on the memory of someone who used, you know, we used to cut their grass in their, in their, in their garden, in my case, you know, veterans. So, so Mike, you know, what, what bringing it to you again, um, what didn't come up in a conversation? What would you like to expand on perhaps in a future show? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've got so many thoughts right now. They're just all bubbling out. I know uh, the first time I wrote about uh, tactical air power and the, the typhoon and how it wasn't uh, terribly accurate on the battlefield. I had a, a typhoon pilot write me and say, that's bullshit. It's like, we hit everyone we wanted to hit. And part of me was like, Oh my God, I'm being criticized by somebody who was there. And the other part of me is, well, the evidence just doesn't support that. So you kind of have to, sort of go with it and, and understand that human memory is fallible and, and use what you can and, and just kind of discard the rest. But um, 
as as the two Johns were talking, I'm I'm thinking that uh, in in some circles the term revisionist history is a dirty word. That um, you're doing bad things if you're doing revisionist history. You're attacking uh, the stories that have uh, been loved and retold over and over again. But my view is that if you're not revising history, you're not really doing history. You're not getting it done. You're not contributing to the debate and adding to the debate. So uh, yeah, for me, all history is about revising what's come before, taking what's been written, uh, doing more research and building on it and hopefully crafting a new story for people. Um, the, the other part of it is that uh, in, in terms of what I'd like to see, everything everything's going towards synthesis. I think the more we know, the more we're able to, to sort of tell that combined story, not just of the Canadians, not just of the Americans, um, but to, to build that story together and tell the story of everybody working together. But even more than that, it has to be bringing in other aspects of it, uh, the air power piece, the naval piece, um, the, the impact on civilians, because these are all absolutely key and, and crucial parts of the story. And too often, just like national stories, they get told in their own um, stovepipes. Uh, air power historians are, are particularly uh, problematic with that, and they're telling the story of of uh, the Air Force and what the Air Force is doing without integrating it into the story on the ground. And that's key. Um, Steve Burke, um, uh, an, an American historian, has just written a fabulous book on the, the bombing of uh, Normandy and the impact it's had on French civilians. And, and that's a story that's been uh, not told and not understood for far too long. And we need more of that. So yeah, it, it, it comes back to that there's been so much written, there continues to be a lot written on Normandy, but there's so much that's yet to be written. And uh, there's so much more room for stories to be told either at the, mi the micro level, uh, the macro level where people are sort of doing the research into that particular unit or that particular weapon system and, and learning more about it than anybody could ever possibly want to know. But you learn stuff from that. And then also by those people who are synthesizing all those accounts and coming up with a, a new narrative of Normandy. So yeah, mm. I, I don't think it's old. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And I think we'll all have to learn to, to, to broaden our, 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 our um, what's the word I'm searching for? What we learn about, not just, I mean, I've read, I've got a section of books about psychology and psychiatry and how the brain works, because I've read them to try and understand this veteran's mem memory aspect and, and how, how people can construct a story out of a little, little, little kind of exaggeration that years later becomes a lie uh, that becomes a complete myth. And I'll try to understand that because I'm hoping it's going to make me a better, per, a better historian by understanding that. And then you want to look at the understanding of the ground and understand the terrain and archaeology and, and emotion, understanding emotion. I mean, like living in France as I do, there's certain subjects that, might, you know, it's like throwing a grenade in a room, Petan, you know, De Gaulle, and the emotion that comes out when you say those words. You have to understand that. You have to understand that French people, when they hear the word Peta, hear words Peta and de Gaulle, a whole raft of stuff like it does for us as Battle of Britain and Spitfire and Douglas Bader and Churchill. And it's mm -hmm. understanding what those words do to us, that this Pavlovian response we have to these words. So I feel in my development, and, I, and I'm not academic, it's by broadening how I learn and what, I, what tools I use to understand history better. Uh, uh, by going at, you know, say reading about psychology. So I think maybe that's where the internet will bring us a, a, a better a better result because we have access to more of that peripheral information that we didn't have 50 years ago. I get, I'm guessing people teaching war studies in the 1950s didn't even, were, were they interested in the psychology of veterans accounts then? I suppose, suppose they were, were they? Probably uh, maybe a little bit by the 60s when they were thinking about First World War veterans accounts and start to be kind of a revaluation of, of that. But I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very good point. I mean, uh, we all rely, and it is perhaps sometimes it's a strength and a weakness on the accounts uh, of veterans. And we illustrate our books with these accounts um, and uh, we listen to the stories and we, we retell them. Um, but sometimes we get caught up a little bit by the kind of the, the, the spirit of the story rather than the actual factual content of it, which is useful in a way. But I, we, we tend to think a, a little too loosely, I think, around uh, our use of oral history uh, a, a little too much. Uh, I think we should be a little more careful about it at times. There are other areas of history, uh, sectors of history 
at the academic level who go into this in so much detail that they actually start to miss the point of what the oral account yeah. was about in the first place. However, there is something to be learned from that to think about who were these people? Why are they telling the story in the way they were? It's still useful just because, I mean, Cornelius Ryan said this donkey's years ago that he could never trust anything anybody ever told him um, um, without it being backed up by factual evidence. He very rarely backed anything up he wrote in his books with factual evidence, but the, n nonetheless, yeah. you know, he captured the essence of, uh, of what the oral history is about. So th th sometimes, we, you know, we perhaps need to engage a little bit more. So doing exactly what you've just been talking about is, is something we should all be engaging with, I think. I mean, it's just understanding that what well, I always say about a veteran's account is that he may get the date wrong or the unit wrong or what German vehicle he was facing wrong, but he won't get the emotion wrong. If he said he was shit scared, he was shit scared. Mm -hmm. it, 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 th th and so it, that's always going to be true. And he comes back to what you said earlier, John, John Bucky, about finding the truth. And the acceptance is there is no single version. There is no definitive version of anything. It's only interpretation and, and, and how you can explain that interpretation to someone else. But... The truth of a veteran's account is on multi levels. There's and and, and we're going to discuss in the next show, the German show, the whole Holger Eckert's, um, the German accounts that 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 has appeared and and how we all wanted them to be true and because uh, it was so, they were so new and exciting and 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 it took some people and some people still not accepted that they're they're not quite what they purport to be and but we want them to be true because we have so little from the germans or we think we have so little from the german side but actually as, as niels would point out on the next show there's a lot more from the german side we just as as english speaking historians have not had access to it properly yet but i think i think we've been round and we've we've i think we've addressed all the points i wanted to go i know john McManus has got to go anyway um but i think uh, rather than just just going round and round and round and going down rabbit holes i think i will bring it to an end there and i certainly if we decide to go back and do something about for example oral histories or about something more specific i'm hoping one of the three of you would like to come back and do something like that again because i i never intended this to be a definitive show because this it couldn't possibly be and i also said to you in in in, in the emails that i like the idea of this youtube format as we don't have to actually provide a conclusion at the end of the book there is no book we don't we can say well we're still not really certain where we are with this but at least we've had a chat about it and and we, we're understanding some ideas to move forward so um have you enjoyed the chat gentlemen has it been has it been good absolutely great fun. Fantastic. fantastic thank you really well fun. yeah so we'll do it again and maybe with some same people say well because i just think there's a lot we can keep on learning from this and again i think if there's one thing that this covid era is going to have, have le left us a legacy is this interaction that we're we're doing now routinely mm -hmm. and the historians are are putting themselves in a position where people can ask them questions i think we we all tend to live behind our barriers a bit and now you know doing these shows live people can put things to us and you know some historians are going to do some trouble saying odd things on twitter and people pick, check up on little things they say and you said that the, this was and I think that's good for us to be to be on the under a bit of pressure all the time to, and 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 investigated and 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 have our sources questioned and our opinions challenged. It, it's helped me. It's made me a stronger host of these shows. People saying you got that wrong, Paul. You you shouldn't have said that. And you go, okay, yeah, point taken. So, well, thanks for watching, everybody. I will just put it on my camera to finish off. So, in terms in terms of what we've got coming up, of course, from Stanley, we've got the second part: Jonathan Ware, Marty Morgan, and Niels Henkerman where we talk about the German aspect. And hopefully they've been watching tonight and made some notes about how we're going to do that. And um, we won't just be talking about the German side of it, but we will continue this discussion, but particularly focusing on what has been revealed to us from the German archives in recent years. So thank you very much, Professors Buckley, McManus, and Bechtel. And thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And we will see you all again at World War II TV. Don't forget, there are book links below to people's books and where you can find them on social media. There's the information about Patreon. And I wanted to say to John McManus, I want to talk about, you know, when we were referencing Canadian authors, your book, to me, are the perfect combination of academic study and, popu and popular storytelling, that you, you write well, but you do it from that academic point of view. Lots of people do one or the other. There's the popular historians and there's the academic, and you straddle both. John Buckley as well. I think your books are amazing. I don't, I don't ask me how much it cost me to buy the armored one because it was it was out of print and it cost me a lot of money and um i'd have sent you a pdf in the end but anyway whatever so thanks for watching everybody i'll see you all again at world war ii tv very shortly i'll end the stream now and um you don't forget links below to go and check these people out further thanks for watching everybody thanks
Thanks.